and welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 102. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about, um, well, a trip to the desert. I uh, Last week um, I talked about the fact that I, I you know, we, we, we put up a question about where would you most like to photograph? And I said I would love to get back to the desert and I went there in Morocco. And I, uh, following that I had a couple of people say, say to me, oh, well, what were your photos like then? So today I'm going to talk a little bit about a trip out to the Sahara Desert uh, where at the point that I turned up in the desert, I kind of realised I'd taken the wrong lens with me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, show a couple of the pictures of that and talk about potential choices. What I'm also going to then talk about is um, I'm going to set a challenge for next week. So stick around. I uh, will tell you more about that. Uh, we also have the question of the week, which uh, has been being discussed in the Facebook group. So a little bit of chat about that. And then we'll be on to the critique section. And in the critique section, um, we have three people who've sent in images. Oh, all right, let's go here. We've uh, Rosemary sent in this one. Robert sent in this one and Roy sent in this one. And I. Uh, Actually, all of them are reasonably happy with the photos that they've taken, except that they're not 100% sure. And we're kind of looking for a bit of feedback and wondering, more or less the same question from all of them was, could I have done something different to enhance the editing or the story or what it was I was trying to capture? So that's really what we're talking about um, today. And if you're here, we are live on YouTube. If you're... Um, me, leave me a comment. Tell me you're here. Tell me what the weather's like. And of course, the other thing, really important, today in the UK at least happens to be Mother's Day. Now, I don't know whether it is where you are, but if you're in the UK today is Mother's Day. So if you fall into that category whereby you really should have contacted your mother, uh, sent her flowers, given her a phone call, and you're suddenly going, oh no, I forgot all about it. Go and do that. This is being recorded. Come back to it. Now, normally I wouldn't say that. Obviously, being live is part of the fun of it. But when it comes to your mum, that's way more important. And just while I'm here, a quick shout out to the mother of our wonderful children, my wife, Maggie, um, who I absolutely adore with all my heart. So, um, yeah, Maggie's here um, in the comments, too. So go wish your mother a happy Mother's Day if that's what your setup is. All right. So leave me a comment, let me know you're here. And I can see we've already got some comments in. So Pap says, this is our last good day weather-wise for some time in sunny Somerset. Um, hope the sun shines on you all, Pat. Well, it's certainly here in Castle Douglas, it is a gorgeous day, um, really beautiful, sunny. Um, I think it is across quite a bit of the UK today. Uh, Diane says, hi Kim, I've tuned in, but I have, still have family here. I think they're going soon. <laughs> Come on, family, out the house, get away. I've got this podcast to watch. <laughs> um, Meg says good afternoon to everyone. Eightful says hello, everyone. A sunny day here in Long Island, New York. Rosemary says good morning, all. So nice to be back after the staggered daylight savings time changes from the deep fog of the Pacific Northwest. Ooh, fog, that's always fun to get out and, and take photos in. Um, yeah, and of course, that was the other thing is last night for us, the clocks went forward. So I'm expecting to probably miss one or two people uh, today <laughs> who maybe if the clocks haven't gone forward in the country where you're in, um, then you may well have been a, a mismatch on timing. So somebody might be tuning in in about an hour's time and wondering where the, the podcast went to. Uh, what else we got? Oh, Roy's here, says, hi, everyone from the West Yorkshire. Warm and sunny here. Stacey says, good morning. Spring has arrived, but a bit chilly here in Hatboro, Pennsylvania. Maggie says, good afternoon, everyone. Jackie says, hello from South Africa. Um, Pat says, I missed that little bird. It's charming. April says, happy northern. Northers, Northers Day? Oh, that should be Mother's Day. That'll just be a... <laughs> Ours is in May in the States. Um, oh, yeah, April's collected Nothers to say Mothers. Uh, Jackie says, Ours is also in May. Stacey says, Happy Mother's Day in the UK. And Melissa, hi, Melissa, um, says, uh, Hi from North Carolina. Glad you could make it along. Right, OK. So what are we going to be talking about? So like I say, uh, in a little bit, I'm going to be talking about... Uh, 
the a challenge that I'm going to be setting you all for next week. And then we will also go on and do the critique section. But for now, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about going out to the desert. There was um, basically, it was about five, five and a half years ago, it was a group of us, a group of photographers, and um, somebody said, uh, or somebody had a connection, well, they actually had a, they had a house out in Morocco, which they also let out as a sometime holiday home. And um, they, there was a group of photographers and they essentially invited us all out to Marrakesh. You know, we all leapt at the chance, went out there and part of it, we were out there for a week. And part of that was a two day drive out to the edge of the desert and a two day drive back again. But when we got to the edge of the desert, it was then the idea was that we, we get to the edge. We then had a camel ride into the desert, stay overnight. It, you know, the camel ride, I think, was supposed to be as the sun was setting. Um, and then we would get out there. We would we'd have out in the desert under the stars and then watch the sun rise in the morning. And uh, it was just, you know, just going to be an incredible experience for, for that. So we, we did, we, we went out, we drove out. And actually what I'll do, I'll show you. The, the problem was, was there was delays in trying to go. On the drive out, it was pretty cloudy the whole day. I mean, we've gone, we've gone two and a half thousand miles from Scotland. Uh, we get down to the edge of the Sahara Desert and it's overcast. We're wondering if it's going to clear as we get to, but we ended up being late. And by the time we got there, the sun had already set and it was cloudy. So what I'll do, I'll just show you through a couple of photos here. It's just, you can see here we've, we've hit dusk. And to give you an idea here that I actually got this set at ISO 1280, um, 160th of a second F5, just to try and, you know, quick snapshot of showing, you know, we've arrived, you can see Camel sitting there, ready to get it's it's very very noisy photo i'm doing my absolute best to try and rescue what i can in the sort of semi darkness here you can see here you know it's all clouded over you can see the lights from the the, the car and we set off out into the desert and first of all i mean this is my first time ever on a camel and Anybody who's been on a camel will know what I mean, but oh my God, do they kind of go all over the place and you've got this little iron bar to hang on to and you are absolutely clinging on for dear life. Um, actually, I'll tell you what I will do just here for a moment. Um, I'm going to show you roughly where it is we went. I thought what I would do is show you here. Um, we've got, uh, so, oh, here we go. There's Morocco. Oh, sorry. Ah make you dizzy here there's Marrakesh and there here is Mazuka. now just to give you a, a general sense of where we are here's Scotland or the UK here's Scotland here's Castle Douglas this is where I live so now we didn't drive down but we did fly down and then we're out into the desert of the Western Sahara now this place here Mazuka is essentially it's a major tourist hotspot. Um, there are all sorts of places here where you can go and you can um, stay overnight in the desert. If we kind of look, go and sort of move into here, there are, oh, I was looking here earlier, there's various, oh yeah, here we can see all sorts of camps in the desert where you, you park up your, your vehicle and you get the camel ride and then you go and stay in some um, luxury tent type thing. Actually, I think it varies from place to place how luxurious the tents are. But there's this big kind of thing that's several kilometres wide and high and deep and what have you. And it takes about an hour to an hour and a half to ride out to the campsite. Now, what happened then was we were, we were, start, we, we were riding out and it was getting darker and darker. And then suddenly off in the distance, you could kind of catch like a little flash of the light out the corner of your eye and somebody said oh I think that must might have been lightning and I was thinking no no it's probably just cars far off in the distance and then it got the flashes kind of got a little bit brighter and then suddenly there was flashes and there was this huge roll of thunder and then the wind started picking up and then there was this we're, we're really quiet in the dark and then there's this massive there's this flash of light and like the whole desert lit up 
for just that fraction of a second. Is that that kind of thing where you realise actually your brain doesn't even know what it's seeing until after it, it's sort of seen the desert and then your brain's working out what it's just seen. And the wind whipped up and the sand's blowing around us and then the rain started pouring down as well. And here you can see there was a there was another vehicle came out to look for because we started taking a bit long to get there. So I think there was a vehicle actually came out looking for us at one point. Um, you can see here in the vehicle headlights, you can see the rain flashing down. Um, now, this is me. Now I've got I've got my camera. I've got it set at. Um, what have I got that set at? Actually, this is now set at 125th of a second, 3.5 aperture. Um, and I'm holding on with one hand onto the, the camel and rocking backwards and forwards and desperately trying to take a shot in the rain. <laughs> the fact that I got anything at all, I was quite pleased with. Um, and then here you can really see the, it kind of whipping around us. Um, so we, and then we, uh, so the, we, I mean, what actually happened was we everybody just burst out laughing. We couldn't believe the fact that we travelled two and a half thousand miles away from Scotland to the desert and it was still raining on us. Uh, sometimes there's no escaping it. Um, so just a, once we were here, this is kind of a wee shot of in the in the structure we were at. Anyway, so it chucked it down with rain the entire night. However, just before dawn the cloud, it's, it started to ease off. And I suddenly realized we were in fact going to be able to potentially see the sunrise. So I let, I came out of the, and there's this huge dune by the side of us. And what I did was I scrambled up to the top of the dune, or well, not to the top, about halfway up. And you can see here, if we look down here into the corner, you can now then see um, that's the shack that we were in before. Some of these down here, these are the kind of, structured tents where there were beds and stuff where we actually stayed in the night. Um, and what I'd done was, I, for, for long complicated reasons, I decided I was only going to take one lens with me on this trip. And the lens I decided to go for was the wide angle lens. And the reason I went for the wide angle lens was because I was thinking about this trip into the desert and I just wanted to try and capture these dunes all over the place. This was the point I suddenly realised I'd essentially taken the wrong lens with me because we had all these dunes, but they look flat. I mean, this is almost like looking at a beach the, that once you're up high, part of the problem with the wide angle lens is for some reason heights just never really get. They all seem to get shrunk down. Everything stretches out width ways, but it kind of compresses on the height. And all the time I found when we drove through the Atlas Mountains, all the photos I have of the Atlas Mountains, none, they looked nothing like as impressive as they actually were. Um, so the sun was starting to rise, just coming above the horizon. And I realised at this point, I'm in the wrong place. I need to, the only, what, what can I do with a wide angle lens? I've actually got to get down in amongst the dunes. So I started scrambling back down, um, back down this big dune. And you can see here, the sun kind of starting to, to you know, is now kind of above the horizon, but we've got these lovely kind of where it's just catching the edge, edge of the dune. So I've got to get down a bit lower and uh, I find my way back down to here. And really what I did this, I've got about a hundred shots like this or fairly similar while I was working towards this. What I was wanting to do was try and capture these camels because what was really weird was as the sun rose, all of these camels, they just suddenly sort of all stood up and started just staring out towards the sun it was something very primal that they were all looking directly at the sun what also confused me for a while was the fact that the camel had was standing on three legs and i thought i wonder what's going on here is it lame um and then there's another camel on three legs uh and this one you can't quite see here but this one was also on three legs and one of the legs is tucked up and i thought they can't all have gone lame at the same time something's a bit strange here until I then saw somebody bringing back a camel who'd gone wandering off. And at that point, I suddenly realized this is actually one of those ancient things they do. have been probably been doing in the desert tribes for thousands of years, which is when you've got your camel, you don't want your camel going wandering off too far in the night. So essentially what they do is they tie one of the legs up. And then that way, at best, the camel can only kind of hobble off. It will, there's a limit to how far it can go. So if you wake up in the morning and then find half your camels are missing or one of your camels is missing, you don't have to go very far before you can find it. 
But this then really was the only way that I could really make the most of the wide angle lens was sort of like this photo and this photo here, where what I'm trying to do is cap the line of the sand and the dunes going up and then drawing your eye up to the camels, um, then silhouetted against the sun and this one here where you've got the, the person bringing back the camel. Now, the sky is kind of blown out, but I, I didn't worry too much about that with the sun because actually I thought what I really love here is I love the silhouettes. I love the way the light's catching the edge. I love the shadows that are kind of coming down, um, all of which would have been lost completely if I tried to if I tried to expose for the sun. Everything would have been totally in silhouette, including most of the dunes and I wouldn't have had any detail. So you're always kind of getting that balance. up. And then we had we had a fortunately with the sun now up, we actually managed to have our, our ride back through, you know, in relative sunshine. Um, this was in November, so temperatures were only about sort of between 25 and 30 centigrade Celsius. Uh, so not horrific. I mean, very hot for Scotland, but the desert temperatures really quite cool. This gives you a better size of the size of some of those sand dunes, which I just wasn't able to get from higher up. You have to do the obligatory, um, <laughs> if you're ever on a camel, <laughs> get the shadow shot of you um, on the camel. Here you can see this one's me holding my camera up, holding on with one hand. Um, and then eventually, of course, trying to get the selfie. Uh, not using my phone, because I, I feel, but you actually get the camera with the wide angle on it. Um, huge amount of fun. I mean, such a touristy thing to do, of course, absolutely, but what an amazing experience. I've never had an experience like it, and I would absolutely love to do something like that again. So if you ever get the chance to go out into the desert, you know, you get the chance. I would really recommend doing it. I would say, though, that, you know, be, <laughs> um, keep your eyes on her. They, I think the camel's called the ship of the desert, partly because you can get seasick on it very easily. Keep your eyes on the horizon. Um, think about carefully about the lenses that you want to take with you as well. Um, right now, where are we? So that's kind of I've just like I say, following on from the fact that some people kind of wanted to know a little bit about what it was I was doing, you know, the, the photos I got. But there was this point whereby I feel actually if you were only going to take one lens, I think a more mid range, something like my 24 to 70 mil, I think would have been the one to take. I don't think there's much point in taking a super zoom, you know, your 200 millimeter lens or something like that, because. Um, really kind of what are you going to zoom in on and at that point you're not necessarily going to get a sense of the size of things because that's for getting close up to distant things. I think a mid-range is probably the best way to do it but if any of you have actually done some desert uh, photography and have actually got a better sense of what lens then leave a comment and let us know. Um, okay right a couple of uh, comments here, let's let's see what we've got. Um, oh, Stacy says Woody is where you can tell. Right, Woody, yes. Okay, but what everybody seems to have nicknamed um, my little uh, <laughs> mannequin sitting on the left. Um, uh, Pat says he's trying to steal the show. Stacy says, sounds fun riding a camel. I would rather be on horseback. Yeah, well, you can be on horseback, but yeah, you've got to give the camel experience a go. Absolutely. Um, April says, wow, that could have been scary. It's amazing. Um, Pat says, were the camels spooked by the lightning? No, actually not at all. They didn't seem bothered by it. Now, whether they, they're used to storms or whether it just doesn't bother them, I'm really not sure. Um, Melissa says, COVID cancelled my trip to Namibia for desert photography, but we have dunes in the, in eastern NC. Is that North Carolina? Um, hard to photograph on a camel. I tried that in the Tar Desert in Raja, uh, Rajasthan. Not too successfully. Yeah, I mean, it is. You are going about all over the place and you've got to have the camera on really at least 160th of a second if you've got any hope of things being in um you also have to kind of learn the rhythm as well so that there's there's points where you pause you go -dum, -dum, you know and you are kind of flopping up and down but at the peak at the height or at the base at the bottom just before it moves again that's the point you go click i suppose in a way an advantage of having a wide angle there 
is there's a little bit more chance of catching something. You can't, you, you cannot be accurate when the camel is moving, that's for sure. Because the other thing is, is you pretty much have to hold it with one hand because you are moving about, you, you have to have one hand on the bar. Otherwise, it's, it's not like a horse where you are, you are sitting on top of the hump. You know, it's, I mean, if there are camel riders who can ride no hands, I've got no idea how they do it. Um, oh, VG's here, says good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, VG. Glad you can make uh, VG's from India. Uh, April says um, happy camels. Uh, Pat says beautiful photo skin. Thank you, Pat. Um, Rosan here is uh, says good afternoon, everyone from uh, Sofia in Bulgaria. Glad you could make it along, Rosan. Um, April says that uh, they like people. They they like the sunrise. Too bad they don't have a camera. Yeah, difficult to operate it without the opposable thumbs as well. <laughs> um, Stacey says, uh, the question, do you have a full frame camera? Would there be a difference if you have a crop sensor? Can I get the effect with a wide angle on a crop? Um, actually, on a, yeah, on a, yeah, if you've got a wide enough wide angle, you can still get it. I mean, my, my, my camera is a crop sensor. My next one probably won't be. Uh, but the one I've been using is Canon 7D and that's crop sensor. But it's a, the wide angles are 10 to 22 mil. So even though allowing for that kind of the fact that, it's on a crop sensor, so it's the equivalent of probably about a sort of 16 to 30. That's still pretty wide. Um, so you just set it to your maximum width. Uh, VG says, beautiful shots, sand dunes and the camels. Thank you. Rosemary says, um, your use of the lines in the dunes to draw attention to the tam uh, camels is stellar. What a great way to make good use from the wide angle. Thank you, Rosemary. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Is that there's the panic, the, you know, the panic. Here I am in the desert. I'm on top of the sand dune. And I can't take, you know, I suddenly every, the photo that I had in my head wasn't going to be possible. So you had then have to improvise. What can I do if I can't get a sense of the dunes from being high up one of the dunes looking down? I'm going to have to get down in amongst the dunes, in which case it is a case of use the wide angle, get the lines of the dunes and keep moving around until the lines line up with the silhouetted camels. Um, uh, oh, Stacy likes the fo photos I took. Melissa says um, classic camel shadows. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Melissa knows, and she's been on camels. You have to get the shadows. You know, at some point or another. You know, I mean, if you don't, you just feel like you've missed the trick. You really do. Uh, Fiji says color of the sky is is way too good. And what a selfie! Yeah, the selfie was fun. What I like about that selfie is you can just see the sort of silly grin on my face. Um, I mean, just to show you that one again, the. I it was wonderful. I I was I yeah I was on an absolute high on that desert. What I really loved about being in the desert when we were on the camel because it was kind of a couple of hours sitting on the camel, and it's so silent. It's so quiet. There's no cars in the distance. There's you can't hear airplanes flying over the head, and there would be chatter, but periodically the chatter would die down, and the only sound would be of the camels on the sand and I found such an utter level of peace in these moments I'm I'm I, you know I'm on the back of a camel in the desert I'm not I can't do anything about the rest of the world all the responsibilities felt like it lifted off my shoulders because there was nothing I could do other than be here on the camel in the desert and so there so that's what I did I, I was more present in that moment uh, than I am most of the time with my life. And it was truly a wonderful experience. And you can see from the silly grin on my face that I was just, yeah. <laughs> the only other time that you, you can find a photo of like, uh, with that kind of grin on my face is when I had a track day in an Aston Martin V8 Vantage. <laughs> Very different experience, mind you. Um, what else have we got? Um, uh, oh, Rosemary says 2470 is such a great workhorse lens. I probably use that one the most. Well, until wildlife gets access and then it's a super zoom. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Melissa says agree with, with Rosemary. Levi says good morning from Minnesota. Glad you could make it, Levi. Um, Stacy says thanks. I'm going to try and decide if I really want to invest in getting a full frame camera. Full frame camera, Stacy, I think is will give you more options. Um, it, they tend to work better in low light situations as well. Um, however, if you're actually, oddly enough, if you're doing wildlife photography, sometimes a crop sensor is working better with big zooms because essentially you're getting a multiplication of nearly one and a half naturally. Um, 
but for nearly every other kind of option um, yeah full frame is probably the better one if you can afford it uh, the bevs oh that's Karen isn't it I think says uh, sounds like a great experience and Pat is very impressed with headgear <laughs> yeah yeah well well while I was out there I had to learn how to do the the, the headscarf bit um, and what a brilliant piece of, of headgear it is too I mean again just to um, just a learning how to do that because it certainly protected the bald patch coming up it protected the back of the neck it was brilliant against the idea of sunburn there were flies about it stopped the flies around the head and when the when the if the wind did get up a bit you could just put it across your face it's absolutely brilliant and I could it's so practical so useful a way of doing it and there's certainly been times <laughs> there's been times in the UK and I've thought oh that would be you know I don't have a hat where's a scarf I could do that and then I suddenly realized you just can't get away with that in Castle Douglas High Street in Scotland um, so unfortunately I don't really get a chance to 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 do the head thing again but um, yeah really practical really really practical and I would certainly recommend it if you if you're in a place where you could get away with it um, right right okay so that's what I wanted to talk about that was the desert if you get the chance um, you have to go for it and like I say personally I'd probably recommend the 24 to 70 kind of thing um, although the wide angle helps you if you wanted to get down in amongst the things but like I say I think a super zoom isn't really going to work in that kind of way the thing is is if you are going to the desert you're not really wanting to take 20 lenses with you because what are the chances are how often you're going to get a chance to change the lenses and uh, on top of that you really really don't want to be getting sand into your camera every time you want to change the lens and if you are on a kind of tourist trip where people are waiting around and you're on a camel and all this kind of stuff you're wanting to minimize the amount of fuss that you're doing um, right and Rosen says the wide angle makes the skies blue deeper doesn't it mm. I'm not entirely sure that's down to the no I, I well yeah I'm not entirely sure that's down to the fact that it's wide angle I sky sky can get very blue in the desert and it feels sometimes that it gets more blue because it's compared to the yellowing sand and I think quite often if you've got your white balance on auto and the auto so and it's registering the kind of yellowish of the sand the auto white balance will give it a slight blue shift to counter to try and rebalance the the, uh, the white balance and therefore that in turn will actually make the sky look slightly bluer but you can play around in Photoshop or in your editing program of choice afterwards and shift around with color shifts as well um, right okay so that's what I wanted to, to say about that um, so what else have we got here yeah just a little reminder here if you find these podcasts useful entertaining um, educational and you feel you'd like to support them or just show some appreciation then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it another way of course is invite your friends along as well um, and of course if you're here for the first time and you've not done so already make sure you click subscribe somewhere in YouTube here they subscribe and then make sure on as well you click the little notifications bell so that you're updated each time I've got a new podcast ready to roll okay so um, just the next thing I want to ch chat about then briefly is we had a question of the week in the Facebook group so for those of you who haven't yet joined the Facebook group there is one called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers just type that into Facebook and you'll find it uh, easily enough um, if you don't do Facebook don't worry too much it's not it's not a huge thing but it's kind of it's another place to socialize in between um, yeah, in between podcasts if you wish so just to kind of get the chat going I've, uh, for the last month or two I've been putting in a question a question of the week and this question of the week I said is if you're on a long photo shoot what's your sustaining snack and sorry and you need a sustaining snack what's your ideal choice um, and it's, if I know I'm going to be on a long shoot an all-day shoot one of, one of the things I love to be able to get is periodically Maggie will make up a batch of flapjack which is oats and um, sometimes it's got honey in it and it might have mixed fruits or dried fruits sometimes nuts or seeds and it's so sustaining absolutely scrumptious really tasty uh, but it's it's a good one for just kind of 
getting the energy levels. So I was kind of curious as to what other people would say. So we had a few, we had a few different ideas here. Diane said um, bananas are her go-to with the potassium and the extras, so, you know, give her the boost. Chrissy said she's usually just make sure she's got plenty of water, but if she's needing a bit of food, chunks of cheese are her kind of <laughs> go-to. Jackie said a flask of coffee and a bar of chocolate. Well, absolutely. If I'm certainly if I'm doing an all day shoot or even a half day shoot, I very often have a flask of coffee with me and usually some squares of chocolate as well. And reckoned almonds or jalapenos with cheese. Jalapenos with cheese. Not my first choice, but then I'm not really into jalapenos, I suppose. But. Yeah, that, but I thought that was brilliant, you know, so they're getting different. This is it. Everybody's got different ideas. VG from India said cold water and vegetable sandwiches, although never had a day long shoot as I have to finish before noon due to the extreme heat here in Chennai. Of course, she's in southern India and the idea of was it mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. You know, <laughs> if you're in a really hot country, you're not just not moving around after lunch. So photo shoots are less likely to take, um, you know, less likely to shoot through the day. Well, maybe outdoors. I don't know, you've got indoors, you've got air conditioned place. If you were doing an indoor shoot all day, what would your choice be? Uh, Sophie said almonds, walnuts, eight apples, 75% dark chocolate. Yeah, wow. Mm, now that's an interesting one. How dark do you like your chocolate? I think that could be a question for next week. Hmm. Um, also dates and prunes and lots of water. Jim said tomato soup and sandwiches. Can't go far wrong with tomato soup and sandwiches, that's true. And Katie said mixed nuts and uh, dried fruits uh, in a snap lock, snap lock bag. God, that takes me back to primary school, elementary school, where we used to have like a snack where my mum would have an envelope and she'd put like um, sultanas, raisins and uh, peanuts and, and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> fruit and dried fruit and nuts in, into a little envelope for my, for my snack when I was about five years old. Yeah, interesting, forgotten about that one. So thank you to everybody who, who answered that one. I thought that was kind of a little bit of fun. Oh, uh, what's this? Um, oh, Stacy said, I, I take fruit, but normally cheese crackers. Okay, uh, Rosemary says, yay, Jackie, coffee and chocolate, the two main food groups. <laughs> <laughs> so Jackie says any excuse to indulge in chocolate. Oh, Mags, Meg says, what about chocolate brownies? Oh, absolutely. If there are chocolate brownies about. And Meg, Meg, I will say now, Meg but does make incredible chocolate brownies. Um, yes, I love to take them. However, are they a sustaining food? No, they are much more of a sweet treat because you then get a bit of the sugar rush from the chocolate. Um, they are absolutely gorgeous. Um, so, uh, oh, April says she likes to have a Cliff Protein Bar. Cool. Excellent. OK, so now what we're going to do, actually, just before we move on to the critique section, Roy had a question for us as well. So Roy, Roy said, does anyone use a loop, L-O-U-P-E, not L-O-O-P-E, L-O-U-P-E, to check the focus when using the back of the screen of the camera? So basically, no, I don't have the camera immediately to hand. A loop is, is it's like almost, if you think like a kind of little triangular or pyramidic kind of thing with a with a little lens on the top, which you can stick over the back of your camera, over the, the screen on the back of the camera. And it allows you to look in and actually see the back. So you know sometimes when you're out there, you take your photo, you try and look in the back of the camera, but the light is too bright, you just can't make it out. And you're kind of trying to shield it and all the rest of it, and it doesn't really work. Well, you can buy a thing called a loop, L-O-U-P-E. Google it and you'll find them easily enough. And so you place that over the lens. And so what that allows you to do is then look through the tiny little lens and actually see the picture and allows you to then also see whether you can, because you can then zoom in using your buttons, whether you're in focus in the place you want to be in focus. Um, so now I, t I have to confess at this point, I've never used one. I've seen other people use one, but Roy is wanting to know if anyone has any recommendations as to a good one to buy or a not so, or a not so good one to avoid. So if you happen to have any experience with a loop um, for looking in the back of your camera, and you know a good one, or you absolutely want to say, for goodness sake, avoid this one, then either leave a, leave a comment in here in the, in the comments now, or go to the Facebook group, Understanding Photography with Kimes, and uh, leave a message. If, if you're doing it this week, you will find that, uh, just scroll down a little bit, you'll find Roy's question, and please leave an answer for him. Um, that would be appreciated. Right, okay, so thank you for that.
So now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the critique section. So the critique section of the, this podcast is the chance where you get to send in your photos to get feedback on an image that you've got. It might be that you were struggling with a particular editing style or cropping or you weren't sure how you could have made the best of the situation. Um, maybe you've got a good photo you like but it never does quite so well in the competition so you're again not sure where you're going wrong. The problem that we all have with, with we take our photos is trying to get genuine good feedback on them because when we put our photos up on Facebook or other social media people click like or they don't click anything at all. Nobody really wants to upset us by saying, well, that's a bit naff. Besides which, nobody or very few people really know how to properly critique an image. If you consider most of the people who are your friends on social media are not photographers, they're going to say they love your photo. Part of it's because they want to make you feel good, which is lovely. You want friends to make you feel good, except for the fact that it doesn't really help you develop your photography. The other thing is, is how would they know what was wrong with it anyway? Would they know how to improve it if they're not really an expert in photography? So we develop this side, develop this side of the, this little corner of the internet, the critique section in the Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers podcast, where you can send me the images. Now, if you're in the Facebook group, you can post the, the picture into the Facebook group. Leave me a little bit of a uh, message saying what it is that you, where you're struggling, where, where your sticking points are, and I will do my best to help you. If you don't do Facebook, then you can email me. There's uh, kim at kimairs.co.uk. You can see my web address just there. So kim at kimairs.co.uk is the place to um, just email me your image along with your, an outline of what your sticking points are and I will do my best to help you. So most weeks we tend to have a critique section, although this time I think it's going to be possibly about three weeks before the next one. We'll talk about that one in a, in a little while. Oh, okay, so what I will do actually, I will just say at this point, um, I'm going to set, a, I've got a challenge set for next week. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you about that one at the end. Okay, so worth sticking around for. If you do have to run off, come back, check the last section of the podcast at the end, um, where I will tell you about next week's challenge, where I'd really like you to submit your images uh, so we can have a, have a share. Okay. Um, oh, April's also said peanut butter and chocolate chips are my favourite. Um, is that cookies or is that brownies or is that flapjacks? <laughs> Melissa said we had a wind, windstorm in, in the tar desert. Bring a rain cover for your camera. I learned the hard way. That's a good piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> right, so back to the critique section then. So the critique then, the first one we're going to look at is, I think we're going to look at Roy. So um, Roy sent, let me find in here. So Roy sent in um, this photo and he said, uh, this is for the critique section on Sunday, please. I like this image a lot, but always wondered if I could, um, if a better one could have been produced. So what we can see here is we've got the flower and the leaves on a stone wall. And so what Roy very usefully did in, for, in terms of critique is he also sent me the original. So we can see the original now in colour. Now I tend to feel in colour the flower and the leaves stand out far more against the wall than the black and white version. But Roy loves black and white. <laughs> <laughs> we know this and there is a different feel there's a different mood to a black and white and this one looks like it's perhaps even got a potential slight sepia toning towards it as well but um however i i so when i look at this what i tend to feel is there is a kind of there's detail loss in the blacks a little bit there's and we're kind of struggling to get really the separation that we see in the color version so what we'll do then, Roy, is let's just open this in Photoshop and see what else we could have done. Now, we have this problem of um, black and white. What we could do, if I go to very straightforwardly, say, do a gradient map, that creates a, quite a strong black and white there. That's perceptual. Go to classic. Yeah, that's a little bit more. Um, but we st we've kind of still got a bit of a problem here of, I think, differentiation. Now, another option here is where we go to, we use the black and white tool here. Now, at this point, just using the straightforward 
uh, black and white option in Photoshop, the leaves have become are almost exactly the same tone as the wall behind. So we've more or less lost that completely. However, what we can do is potentially play around with the sliders. So if I take the yellow, for example, and I slide it right, you can see that it boosts, partially boosts the green, but it also ends up boosting the flower as well. So while we lighten the leaves, the flower itself tends to burn out somewhat. So the other option here, if we take the green slider and move that to the right, you can see that that, oh, it's doing it slowly. Right. That's a bit of a pain. Okay, we can see that we're able to lighten or darken the leaves without necessarily affecting the flower. So there's possibilities here of maybe lightening the leaves, but we still have a little bit of a problem here with the fact that the, if the more we lighten the leaves, we more we lose the flower. The more we kind of create the differentiation between the leaves and the flower, the more the leaves actually disappear back into the, you know, start ending up matching with the wall. So you kind of ended up with a bit of a tricky one here, Roy. Because here, the leaves stand out completely from the wall, so what do you do? Now, I think part of the problem that we have Let's go and take a look at the, the black and white version for a moment. Um, and I think part of it here really is that whilst the, the flower is the main part of this, we want the flower and we want the leaves, but you can't, I feel you're too far out with this, that actually you're going to get a better story if you crop closer in. So really, I think if we were to do this, say we come down here, bring this in, and then a couple of it depends how far you want to come in but say we we stick the flower there and then bring in now at this point we can maybe start playing around with our black and white um you know, where are actions where are we um sorry that's black black and white that's the bit that i'm looking for and now if we nudge up the greens a little bit we can allow the you know we can kind of play with the contrast a little bit more, or we can, if we put the gradient map over and over the above that, that's also another possibility as well. And now we, I think here, when you look at this, when we're in this much closer, I think we've got much more a sense of separation of the colors, but it's also allowing us to give a bit more depth so that the wall behind is now darker, is there's more in the shadow. So you get a sense of there being a darkness behind the leaves, and then we've got the mid-range tones of the leaves, and then we've got the highlights of the um, of the flower. And then if I just take all that into Camera Raw for a moment, and then potentially maybe, what if I hit Auto? Not totally sure. Maybe we can even up the exposure a bit, but bring the highlights down a touch. Potentially play with the clarity a little bit. Actually, you know, I'm not sure if I'm ruining that a little bit. Let's take a little look at that. Maybe that's, actually, I think that's overkill. We were probably better off with that. So in that case, maybe we don't need to edit it much more than that. So I think this kind of thing, the, the, what it's allowing is we've now got the light flower at the front, we've got the mid-toned greens in the middle, and then we've got the dark shadow of the wall behind. But when we look back at your original one here, because we've got so much more wall around here, the leaves, it's difficult to tell where the leaves end and the lighter parts of the wall begin. So nothing seems to stand out and separate in quite the same way. Whereas this, I think, helps. And in fact, actually, to be honest, I think you could possibly even pull it in closer if you wanted, if you were to kind of do something like this. Um, even more so then, and I think this then is really creating that sense of depth. We can now really see the flower sitting on top, the leaves here, and the shadowy darkness behind of the wall is giving us that sense of essentially three layers going back through. So I hope that helps, I hope that makes sense, uh, Roy, that basically um, your, your original problem with it, I think, is, is essentially it's too far out coming in closer allows that sense to get the different layers and allow the wall to be the darkest part rather than all the lichens and the different shades of the wall ending up being the same tones as the leaves when you turn it into black and white. I mean, straightforwardly, when we're in colour, 
it's very clear that the leaves are separate from the wall. But when you go to black and white, it isn't because of all the kind of mottling. So that sense of then getting in close uh, just allows the wall to be dark behind and we get much more of a 3D sense. So hope that makes sense, Roy. Um, uh, hope you found that useful. Right, OK. Oh, Peter's arrived and says, a late hello to all from Anna. In fact, not just a late hello, a happy birthday to you, Peter. It seems to be, Facebook told me today it was your birthday, so happy birthday, Peter. Um, glad, you could, glad you felt you could make it along on your birthday. Um, okay, Stacey says, I like the crop version, uh, both the black and white and the colour are good. Uh, good edit information. Rosemary says, that's a tricky black and white conversion, Roy. Zooming in does help with removing some of the issues of the close tones. Uh, April likes the edit of the flower photo as well. And Roy says, thanks. Um, oh, Diane reckons there's a big, big difference on that. Oh, and April's also wishing you a happy birthday, Peter. Right. OK, so let's move on then to the... Um, uh, oh, Pat says, I believe the wall is Skipton Castle, a wonderful place. Do you recognise that piece of wall? <laughs> or did did Roy leave that bit of information for you somewhere, Pat? Otherwise, I'm seriously impressed with your knowledge of walls of Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> right, OK, next up then, we're going to look at... Um, let's take a look at Robert's. No, let's take a look at Rosemary's, because I know Rosemary usually has to run off... A, quite has quite a tight schedule so let's let's take a little look at rosemary so rosemary sent us let me just close that close that and find rosemary's image and says i believe this is a dark eyed junko um I'm not a flower a bird specialist, so I will take your net, your word for it, uh, Rosemary. I was sitting on a stump in our side yard one uh, one early morning this past September. The dandelion seed uh, on uh, at his throat. You look here, you can see a little dandelion seed just sort of has managed to attach itself to his feathers. Um, and a very plump chest, evidence of being a well-fed, along with his willingness to hold still to have his picture taken, all suggests to me that this is a very contented little bird certainly go with along with that the lighting was tricky because of the side towards the camera was in shadow is there anything different i could have done in post-processing to improve the story slash composition slash detail so to compare then again rosemary rather usefully sent me the um sent me the raw file so here you can see the original photo and if i just kind of open that as is at the moment okay let's just close roy's here for the moment um, in fact, I suddenly realised, let's just change this workspace here so that I'm not overhanging the photo at all. So if we take that and compare it to, um, I'll just open this in Photoshop as well, so I can just flip backwards and forwards. We can see that uh, Rosemary's cropped in really quite a lot, but what she has also, what we can also see here is that on the original, this lot is quite lost in shadow. Um, Whereas, so she spent quite a bit of time bringing up the highlights and making sure that we can see the eye and we can see the detail in the feather, as opposed to you know, um, the original shot. So I think really, Rosemary, to, to be honest, the, 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 you've cropped this, you've got a rule of thirds, you've you know, sitting to one side, nice soft bokeh in the background. I think you've made quite a nice crop. If you wanted, you could go even closer. Something like that, maybe. You can sort of put how much of the stump do you need? Just enough to kind of keep it going. But we, if you end up with that, the cross of the, the thirds on the eye of the bird there. Um, but having said that, I, you know, I think the, the thing with the original here, what I would say is if we look at the original, there's more detail in, in this little white patch here. In your... In your um, keenness to brighten up the the darks the shadows in the bird here you kind of blown the highlights a little bit there and I think that so there's possibilities let's just go back and open this again that what you could do with this is if we zoom in here and supposing you've brought the exposure up a little bit you can see so as soon as I bring the exposure up we lose detail in there we might get we might gain more from the shadows but we've lost 
So if you were to bring that up, but actually bring the highlights down. Notice if I bring the highlights down, let's just zoom in a bit here. We, we actually get quite a bit more detail out of the raw file than you would have uh, maybe initially realized. And then, even if you do this in two stages, you have one version where you've got you've 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 lightened up the, the the shadows, but you take another version where you know essentially you can then copy that bit or you create a mask. Okay, that's is that going to fit? Is this a slightly? Is this being resized slightly? I think that's actually if I just try and line that up ish oh, looks like it's slightly different slightly different size okay <laughs> now that makes it sort of slightly harder to do um, where am I so am I gonna have to actually enlarge this a little bit just just there okay I'm not gonna mess around too much with it but all I really want to do like yes yeah, just sorry I have to roughly do it and then you mask it um, and then, sorry, actually we should have inverse marks, masked that, but we'll just do that. And then um, what you can do is just paint back in that little bit. Oh, sorry, I need to put that back up to 100%. Paint back in that little bit of overexposed there. Um, no, gone, gone a bit too far there, but anyway. So, so really you can see that you can, if you do it in two stages, sort of two lots of edits uh, as such. Go to the raw file, do one raw file where you're really making sure you get the highlights right, do another one where you're doing the shadows, and then, you know, if, if you can't get them both done in the same edit, do two separate edits, overlay them, and then mask off, and I think you can do that. But to be honest, that's me just fiddling at the edges there. Most people, if they're only gonna look at it this size, would never be able to tell the difference. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I I think you've done well with what you've got, you know, your, your original, um, you know, you've, you've, from where you've started, I think you, you probably did the right kind of crop because the bird is, is sort of pointing to the left of the screen. You wanted to crop it so that you had the space in front of it. You've kept the bouquet. Um, I think you've done a pretty good edit there. Like I say, the only thing I would really say is that little bit of highlight, but we're kind of, you know, playing at the edges there, but I, I, you feel good. I think I think you could feel good about what you did there. So um, anyway, hope that gives you a couple of ideas, Rosemary. Um, oh, Roy says yes, it is Pat. So it was actually a wall in Skipton, <laughs> Skipton Castle. <laughs> well, I think everybody's seriously impressed with you there. Um, all right. Oh, Pat says I must fess up. Roy mentioned it before. Uh, the miracle is I remembered. OK, so, yeah, it's not that, you know, every single wall in Skipton. <laughs> Nicely done, though, Pat. Uh, Stacey says love the dark, love dark eyed junco. They are great little backyard birds. I don't get them in the UK as far as I'm aware. Uh, lovely little bird, though. Um, and uh, April says it is a dark eyed junco. Oregon group in New York. We have the slated colored group. Mm. OK, and Rosemary says, excellent suggestion for recovering the blown highlights. Thanks, Kim. Excellent. OK, so on to the final image that we're going to uh, talk about, which is Roberts. And then I will tell you about the challenge I have for you next week. Oh, and Rosemary saying thank you for the specific ID, April. So, OK, let's move on to Robert then. And uh, Robert sent this picture and says, um, I was in California's Mojave Desert this week. So he actually made it to the desert, although this looks slightly less desert-like than the one I was in. Um, the ground is covered with tiny yellow flowers called brittlebush. Uh, Encelia farinosa. Encelia or Encelia farinosa. Um, I know it sort of sounds like a kind of Harry Potter spell, doesn't it? Encelia farinosa. Wave your, wave your wand and instantly turn somebody into a brittle bush. <laughs> <laughs> I took several shots and noticed this wasp flying in the focal plane. So if we just zoom in here, see the little wasp. Wow. Um, it's not extremely detailed. as This is a very cropped photo. It is also just at the back edge of the depth of field. So it's just starting to go out of focus. 
There are only four colours in the photograph and I was able to play with it. Hopefully you'll find it somewhat interesting. If I'd known the wasp was in shot, I would have focused on it. It is less than a centimetre in size. Let me know how I could have improved my composition and editing. Okay, so again, what Robert has very usefully done is sent me the original. So we can look here and we can see um, Robert's edited piece where we've got the, the wasp just about coming into shot. Um, and if I double click on his, uh, so here we can see the original. And what we can see is that it really is a much bigger photo, which is really cropped in from. Here we can see bushes in the background. We can also see that it really is a very narrow focal plane. So if we zoom in, we can see the wasp here. Um, when we zoom back out a bit and uh, so let's just briefly open that as is. Now, one of the things, if I look at the, the settings on here, Robert is, has got this at an, he's using a 50 mil lens, um, one eight thousandth of a second, which is how he's managed to cap that, capture the wings wasps absolutely frozen. Um, f 1.2 so he's using an f 1.2 50 mil lens and an f 1.2 it's a very wide aperture which gives you a very narrow depth of field and so what that means that what that's given us is when we look in here the blur level anything just really you know a couple of inches in front of the focal plane is out of focus and a, an inch or so behind the focal plane is out of focus so we have ended up with this very We've got a line of flowers in focus and then everything else comes out of it. Now, I think really here, Robert, part of the thing is, is for the kind of lens you're doing, for this kind of shot, I think you'd have been better off getting in there in the first place. Now, you've you've cropped in what you've done. Let's just close that one from Rosemary. You've cropped right in after the event. So essentially, we've gone from here to here, more or less. And that's a really big crop. That's a lot of cropping. Um, as such, you've, you're, you're down to having lost a certain amount of detail. And, and obviously, clearly, you know, we it would have been, if you'd managed to sort of take the, the photo even closer in, you would have managed to get much more of the wasp in the detail but I think you would have also got more of the flowers in the detail as well and it's nice to have that kind of soft out bokeh in the background but then it does mean I think you could have got that um if we get, sorry we go back to the original here um when you've got a really narrow aperture I think what you're trying to do works best when you're when you're getting closer because because you've got such a narrow focal plane, you've got to make sure that that narrow focal plane does in fact fill a significant part of the photo. Because here too, as you know, too much of it is out of focus, in which case, which has meant that if you wanted to make a, a photo, you've had to crop in. So you're rescuing it after the event. So I think the key thing to remember, if you're using a really wide aperture, is getting close to begin with, getting this close, fill the frame with, you know, with the yellow flowers, getting close. Now, <clears throat> obviously, there's a certain amount of luck as to whether you happen to have an insect flying in or not. And what I would also say with this, it is the insect which kind of makes that photo, which you already know, which is why you've chosen this one out of the hundreds of other photos you took. But even before the insect, I think you're better off trying with that focal plane, just being in close. You know, we can see we've got all this other bit. We've got all these bushes in the background which aren't really contributing to it. The other thing is, is I think that because you've you've then gone in close and as such, you've lost some of the detail. You've really kind of gone and I think slightly overcooked the editing. I mean, if I go back to if we go into Photoshop here and let's just um, again, let's just kind of crop back in something like that to give you give us a rough idea of what it was you were doing and we come out to here so now what I do let's just duplicate that layer and if I go to camera raw filter and because if we go right in you know this isn't fully in, in focus and you know we've we've lost a lot of detail then the temptation is what well, what we do is we maybe go to the detail bit we nudge up the sharpening a little bit and then maybe in here we nudge up the texture a bit and then maybe we nudge up the clarity 
And so that then is allowing us to kind of make it feel like there's a sharper thing going on with the wasp. However, I think having done that, what's happened is we kind of lost some of the beautiful bokeh in the in the background. This is now itself has become kind of a bit cramped. So there's a beautiful softness in this, especially as you've got this at an ISO 50. So it's really creamy, which that creaminess has kind of gone away at the top. Maybe we want a little bit more in the wasp, but we don't need quite as much in the background. So as such, what I would say with you when you're doing something like this as well is to selectively do it. Having done this, let's mask that off. Let's close that off. Opacity down to something wipes across the, the wash. We just allow those those in focus to be a little bit sharper and there, but I'll drop that down to 13 and just slightly take out a little bit on the edges there. So we're kind of grade eight, grade eight, grade eighting the, um, the, the sharpness and the, the editing part of it as much as we're editing, doing the, the sharpness. So, sorry, as much as we're, as much as you've done with the, the focal plane. <clears throat> so I think then that something like this potentially works you know, so now we've got we've we've got the wasp. If you if you can, if you're still including it, maybe actually we just need to nudge that in a little bit closer. Again, something like that, so we can see the wasp. It is a bit tricky because it it stand out. If you depending on the size of screen you're looking at, better. But whereas when we're in here, because you've got it slightly harder, uh, makes a difference. Wide aperture to begin with, because otherwise the effect is being lost. Be a bit more selective with the editing <clears throat> and just sort of, you know, if you're going to sort of boost it for it, that you don't kind of kill it off with editing the whole photo as such. So, so I hope that helps. Right. I've... Um, uh, oh, April says, love the yellow. VG says, oh, suspended in air, froze for Robert. Uh, Meg says, fantastic shot, Robert. Um, Stacy says, does sound Harry Potterish. Wave the wand. <laughs> uh, April says, great depth of field. VG says, what a great sight. Yellow flowers looking like a carpet. Um, April says, if only the wasp knew he made the best photo. <laughs> um, Ro Rosemary says, could you isolate the clarity by just painting it over the wasp? Which is pretty much what we just did. So obviously, I was just kind of behind you there. Stacy says podcast is freezing up a little. Uh, oh, a couple of others said yes and buffering just now. So hopefully hopefully that won't be too for too much longer. Right, so we're kind of coming to the end now. <clears throat> and to everyone who said that is don't know what's causing the buffering, don't know why. Um, my apologies, I hope it doesn't interfere too much. Doesn't it? It does say excellent connection there. So not sure quite what's causing it. Um, right, so what I want to talk about just briefly before we head off is next week I'm setting a challenge and the challenge is going to be wilderness. And I'm basically coming out the idea of having done the desert shots. Now, I will cut you a bit of slack and we're going to be a bit broad with our definition of wilderness. But if you have desert shots, if you have you know, basically what I'm looking for, it doesn't have to be desert and it doesn't have to be the, the steeps of Russia or um, the, you know, the t Arctic tundra or anything like that. <clears throat> if you have these shots, then that's fantastic. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> oh dear, I'm really, I'm getting a lot of the buffering thing. Hope that um, it kind of comes. This is awkward. Not sure, just have no idea what's causing it. Um, yes, but if you don't have any of these wonderful photos sitting in your in your folders and you don't have the chance to get out to the desert or the Arctic tundra, then I will accept things even like your garden or if there's places where you go. The idea of wilderness here, I think, really is about essentially trying to make it look not like it's man-made. When I say your garden, what I mean is that at this point you would have to get macro levels probably down with the insects. So you're almost kind of in your own bit of... Um, jungle or there's a deserted bit of garden what I want is I want a lack of man-made stuff in there I don't want it full of buildings I don't want it full of obvious stuff now a single person in it it might be that you have a single building in a distance because 
the single man-made object or the single person helps to emphasize the largeness and the emptiness of the space but essentially the idea of the wilderness being something where really people aren't or not many people are if you have to go into the to trail it so when you when you come to the um okay really hoping that you're going to get some of this <laughs> or at least some of it will come through in the replay at any rate um <clears throat> so yeah i will write a bit more about this i'll put it in the facebook group but i'll also write it into the um youtube video ready for next week so wilderness challenge get your photos into me try and get them in by friday um i will i will warn you actually i'm away until Saturday so it might be a little bit of a rush for me to try and get in but put your photos in either into the Facebook group or email them to me and tell me a little bit of the story behind it why you chose this photo this is not about critique although if you're really stuck with the photo and you want a bit of feedback I might be able to do one or two but primarily this is a this is a chance to show off a little bit show us your favorite wilderness photo um, and what we're trying to do here is inspire each other OK, we want everybody to kind of look at these photos and go, oh, wow, that looks like a lot of fun. I wonder if I could have a go at doing something similar. So that's it. That's pretty much us. Um, thank you to everybody who turned up. Uh, my apologies about all this buffering at the end. I really don't know what's causing it. I, it still says I have an excellent connection. Um, I hope you've managed to get the end of this. Um, but Wilderness Challenge next week and then the week after that, we're going to be on the two year anniversary and the Smug Awards. So make sure you've subscribed. Make sure you tune in. And uh, thank you, everybody, to, to turning up. Take care. Bye bye.